Hi, and welcome to episode number 167 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I'm Mark Mandel, and I'm here with my colleague, the wonderful Gabby Ferreira. How are you doing today, Gabby? Good. I like the wonderful. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, who do we have joining us today? We have today Emma Haruka Ival. She will be talking a bit about the number pi. If you've seen like any of the news recently, it's kind of <laughs> gone everywhere, which is awesome. So Emma's going to talk about how she broke the world record for Pi, which is pretty amazing. After we finish with Emma, I'm going to be asking Mark the question of the week. How do I track what is happening to my containers? Who has access to them, changes, and so on, so on. But like always, why don't we start with our cool things of the week? Let's go. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go first. Okay, you can go first. <laughs> so the first cool thing of the week, the website has gone live for Next on Air. So as probably many of you know, the flagship event for Google Cloud, Cloud Next, is coming up. But if you're unable to attend in San Francisco, there is a live stream that you can watch next on air. It's actually pretty cool. The website's live. We'll have it in the show notes. But it has multiple channels. There's a live stream so you can see like the exhibitions. You can see particular breakouts. There'll be exclusive content, customized programming, all sorts of good stuff. Probably also worth noting is that if you're interested, you could also organize a next extended event. So if you want to bring your local community together and basically watch the live stream together and do awesome things, read the guide, you have a look at the becoming a host, all the details therein. There already are a few set up. So you can also check out the map that shows you where next extended events are happening. So if you want to check those out or attend any of them, you can see which ones are local. So make sure to check out that. I think it's going to be really cool if you aren't going to be there in person here in San Francisco. But another cool thing is if you are going to be there in San Francisco for next, you can get cloud certified and we are going to be making available six cloud certified exams to be taken at next on site. So there is a link on the blog to see what you need to know to be able to do the exam. Fantastic. We're going to do a shout out to our friends over at Google Maps. They're pushing out a few new releases with GDC. Well, GDC will be right now, actually. But they're adding some new features. So if you wanted to uh, have gameplay data that was based on, say, Google Maps pathfinding and routing algorithms, you'll have access to that now. They also have interesting information about biome data. So basically what kind of environment you're in, like a desert or a grassland or things like that. They're also exposing elevation information as well. So whether, you know, you can go up and down, like the height of where you are, that kind of stuff. So if you want to learn more, we'll put a link in the show notes. But if you're going to be at Game Developers Conference, which is literally right now, make sure to come to the Google booth and check it out and talk to all the people there. Now a trip to memory land and nostalgia from the 90s. Oh, I'm so excited. You have a mission. Google Earth just released a game within the app where you can try to catch Carmen San Diego. And you go around the world to find the jewelry that was stolen by Carmen. Ah! So this is actually the first game and it's going to be a series of games. So you just need to keep an eye for it. Literally an eye for it. <laughs> I'm so excited. I need to play this very badly. This was literally my childhood. <laughs> you just said your age. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I don't mind. Well, I tell you what, why don't we go chat to Emma and hear about all the amazing things she's doing with Pi. Let's go. Let's go talk to him. I'm very impressed. Let's do it. So it is an exquisite pleasure to have Emma Haruka Iwao joining us today, fellow developer advocate. How are you doing, Emma? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, thanks for coming to join us in the, in the podcast booth. We're going to talk about Pi Day today. But before we do that, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what do you do here at Google? Sure, I'm a developer advocate with Google Cloud Platform, so on the same team as Gabby and Mark. I was working in Tokyo until December, and I just moved to Seattle, so I'm one of you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. My work is usually around computing products like virtual machines, storage, network, these all subtle products and technologies, not like containers, machine learning, or something like everything you just think of when you hear the word cloud. So Emma, what is Pi? Tell us what is Pi for the layman, early woman in this podcast. Sure. Pi is the constant of the ratio, so I, I can read this. 
a circle's circumference to its diameter. So usually you'd use 3.141, and it goes on like this. You, you probably <laughs> learn it. How many numbers of pi can you remember? So I can do it in, in Japanese better. Something, <laughs> it's like usually four. Yeah. Okay. It's more than I can remember. I got like 3.14 and that's it, then I'm yeah, done. Yeah, 3.14. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a usual approximation, yes. Yeah, that's what a calculator is for. So what would I use pi for? What's this implication? It's everywhere, right? So whenever you see a circle on your computer, they use pi. And if you want to play a game, and usually you have some kind of UI, part of those are circular, right? When you launch a rocket, they use pi to calculate their trajectory. It's everywhere. So, Emma, how do you calculate pi? Good question. I used Y Cruncher, that's a program developed by Alexander E. So, I just designed a cluster on Google Cloud, run the program for four months, and here I got the results. Did you just say you, you design a cluster? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. The amount of data didn't fit on a single machine, so I had to use 25 machines, and it takes a little time, like four months. Oh, wow. Four months? <laughs> yes. How many, how many numbers of pi did you calculate for? 31 trillion digits. And a little bit. So it goes like 3, 1, 4, 1. So exactly like the sequence of pi. Oh, that's neat. 31 trillion digits and a little bit. So step us through this. So there's a particular algorithm that you use for calculating pi, and there was an existing program for that? Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. And then you distributed that across multiple machines. Is that right? Not technically. So that program doesn't work in a distributed manner. And Pi is fundamentally difficult to, like, for parallel computing. It doesn't work well. And so here's a problem. On Google Cloud Platform, you can attach up to 64 terabytes of storage to a single virtual machine. Right. And in order to calculate 31 trillion digits of Pi, you need more than 170 terabytes of disk. And in order to mount that amount of storage, I had to run 24 storage nodes and attach them remotely over like the network. So I had to use 25 machines. So you use 24 machines, but how did you go from one digit to another? It's not made to work distributed. How did you get to link one thing to another? Sure. So the computation, the main program run only one of the machines and the other machines for just storage. They are literally disks, uh, NFS. So you just mount these disks on the main node and you just store the data on other nodes. So the calculation, the algorithm itself wasn't distributed at all. And we use iSCSI instead of the regular NFS protocol because iSCSI uh, suit better for random access and we needed lower latency, more bandwidth for a lot of random reasons, right? So you made 31.4 trillion and a little bit, apparently, just and, and, and a little bit. And a little bit. Why that number? The previous world record was around 22 trillion digits, and I wanted to make it significant. I, I could do like 23 trillion digits, but it will be like, oh, you just did it to break the world record. <laughs> and I wanted to make it similar to Pi, like, a meaningful little bit by making the sequence exactly as the same as pi. Pi goes on like three, one, four. So the actual number of digits goes like three, one, dot, dot, four trillion digits. Is this all of pi? No, pi continues infinitely. So you never get the entire digits. It's a irrational number. There's no end. So why did you do that, Emma? Uh, why did you decide to break the world record? Because it sounded cool. <laughs> <laughs> course, That's a good uh, reason. Yeah. I have a long story here. Basically, when I was a kid, like 11 years old, I learned about Pi and soccer in school, probably. And at that time, I had access to some BBS not the internet, before the internet. And I was able to download a program to calculate Pi so I could do something on a computer that I learned at school. So it was cool. And I wanted to actually calculate more digits. I knew, so the program had a, a text about the current world record and it was, I think, billions of digits or something. Oh, yeah. And I wanted to calculate more digits. But I couldn't. I was terrible at math. I had no idea how these algorithms worked. 
So I had to wait. <laughs> Actually, you got to Google. <laughs> yeah, basically. And I didn't have enough computing resources either. I had no access to supercomputers because I was an ordinary kid. And I just started calculating 22 divided by 7. It's a good approximation of pi, but it took a while to realize it was not actually true value of pi. My math teacher told me the approximation, and I wrote a program. That's one of my first programs I wrote in C, and I was cheated. <laughs> <laughs> How much disk space did you end up actually using when you calculated pi to 3.4 plus a little bit? I'm just going to keep saying that, trillion digits. How much disk space did you actually end up using up? So for the temporary workspace, it used about 170 terabytes. And to store the digits, you'd need about 30 terabytes because each digit is a byte. Oh, that makes sense. And is this data set available to use? Can other people play with it? Yes, sure. Uh, so we have the digits available via HTTP. So you can actually download the, the digits entirely from Google Cloud. Or it takes a little time, like weeks, <laughs> to download the digits. <laughs> and if you don't just want to play with it, you can launch a virtual machine on Google Cloud and copy snapshots of the digits. I'll put that link somewhere. We'll put it in the, the show podcast. notes. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it, it's really easy. So we have snapshots of the uh, disk images. You just need to copy it. It takes usually 10 minutes to copy the digit, like 30 terabytes of data, and we make the digits as a disk for your virtual machines. And you just need to mount it from your virtual machine. Um, if you're running Linux, you, you just need to run a mount command. If you're running Windows, you need to open the control panel and mount it. So you said uh, that it took four months to calculate it all. How much did that actually cost? Um, that's a good question. I don't know <laughs> um, precisely because I use a Google Cloud project uh, shared with other people, so I, I don't have access to the exact number. But I did some math, and it's around two hundred thousand dollars. That's fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. That's cheap. It is not cheap. <laughs> If you build a computer, like buying parts from like hardware stores and eBay and stuff, you could probably build a computer that can calculate 31 trillion digits of pi in four months for tens of thousands of dollars. So if you build a computer, it'll be, it'll be much, much cheaper. Yeah, but it's a trade-off. With the fun in that it's thing. a trade-off. It's on <laughs> cloud. So you have redundancy, you have all that kind of stuff. So it's just not the storage, you know. Exactly. So if you run this calculation on your computer, like physical computer, you'd have to take care of disk failures because hard drives break. Even SSDs break, so you probably need to replace disks a couple of times during your calculation. If your disk fails, you need to stop the calculation and replace the disk and restart the calculation from a checkpoint. You'll lose some time for that. And backups and restoring is much harder on physical hardware because if you're running the program on cloud, you just need to take snapshots of your disks. So that, that's easy. You even don't have to stop your program. But with physical hardware, because hard drives are not designed for simultaneous IOs, you need to stop the program, copy the data to other disks, and restart the program. So it, it's much harder on physical hardware. I was going to ask, did you actually have any failures during the four months, or did it just keep running? Um, from hardware standpoint, we had no post failures or interruptions. But during the early experiments, when there is live migration, because on, on Google Cloud, when there is something like maintenance or software upgrades on the host side, we live migrate virtual machines to another host. And live migrations usually takes tens of milliseconds if you're running a web application on that. But for Pi calculation, it takes as long as 15 minutes. Whoa. So live migration works in this way. The program starts to copy memory regions and disk to a new host. And it usually doesn't impact your compute uh, calculation. And then when the program thinks they copied most of the memory regions, because you never catch up, it stops the virtual machine, copy the rest of the memory regions, and restart the computing on the new node. But Pike program works in a way that it literally rewrites every memory on the virtual machine. So memory bandwidth is faster than network bandwidth mm. in most environments. So the live migration program never catches up with memory copies. So it needs to stop a little bit longer, like usually a minute, 
and then it restarts the calculation. But it still needs to copy the rest of memory from the older machine to the new machine. So uh, that slows down the calculation for 15 minutes. Because we used iSCSI to mount remote disks. There is a timeout value for iSCSI, and the default value is around 10 seconds to 15 seconds. That's usually enough for any network switch. But we had to increase the value to 15 minutes. Got it. But once you increase the value, it was yes. fine. Yes. And there are small softwares. Large scale computing is hard because. Yeah, I was going to say, like, like, stuff breaks. Like we stuff all... breaks. And usually memory disks are protected by checksums or ECCs mm -hmm. or some kind of error detection and correction mechanisms. But we read and wrote around 10 petabytes of data over the four months. And there were two occasions that the data was cropped silently and Wirecruncher, the program, detected the corruption. Oh, no. Well, good that the program detected it. Yeah. So in that case, can the Wirecruncher pick up where it left off? Or do you have to yeah. start? Oh, okay. no, 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 no. It, it, oh, that's good. Yeah. I have a curiosity. It does like a double write, or like one to save the disk and one to a saving point, or how does it work? Like it has saving points every hundred digits or something like that. Sure. So Wirecruncher saves checkpoints. So checkpoints are internal structure of its work memory. So it flashes its internal structure to the disk occasionally, maybe twice a day or once a week, depending on the progress of calculation. And Pi is calculated in a way that you need to store actually uh, all the digits you're working on at any point of the calculation. It, it doesn't work like you calculate the first 100 digits and then store data and continue the uh, a next 100 digits or something like that. You need to decide how many digits are you going to calculate like before you begin and move on. You mentioned how much disk space you were using. How much memory was in there? So I used one of the biggest virtual machines with 1.4 terabytes of memory. And you, how much of that did you actually end up using? Like a lot of it? A lot of like 99% of wow. that. I just left 20 gigabytes or something for extra, like just in case. And how many cores? 96 cores, VCPs. It's on the uh, Xeon Skylake processor. So there were a couple of virtual machines I could choose from. One is the N1 Megamim 94. That's the machine I used uh, with Skylake processor, 96 cores, 1.4 terabytes of memory. The other choice was N1 Ultra Mem 160 with 4 terabytes of memory and like 160 cores. Wow. But it uses Broadware processor of Intel, and it doesn't support AVX512, which would significantly speed up the calculation. And Wirecruncher doesn't work very well with NUMA. So the NUMA is an architecture where you have multiple processors, memories attached to each of the processors, so they have no uniform access, like latency and bandwidth to each region of the memory. So the more cores you have, uh, the more complex and slower the memory access would be. So actually adding more cores might have slowed down the calculation. So I decided to go with the uh, two-socket system with AVX 512 support. Uh, AVX 512 is an accelerated uh, instructions by Intel. So it processes 512 bits of data in one clock. So it, it's much faster than regular floating point operations. I never thought like actually changing the number of cores would actually make the access to the memory slower. Uh, that's a cool, interesting test case to show up like how that can influence proportionally inversed situation. That's totally cool. Yeah, totally. Uh, it's counterintuitive, isn't it? So for large scale computing or mathematical simulations, memory bandwidth is one of the important factors to determine hardware and algorithms. And recent computers are really constrained by memory bandwidth. So you can't actually feed the CPU with enough data that you need. So CPUs are much, much faster usually, more than 10 times faster than the main memory. And storage is much slower than memory. So in order to keep CPUs busy, you need to design memory architecture and memory access patterns carefully. That's really interesting. What was probably the most surprising realization you had when you were building this stuff? Um, it was much harder than I thought. So in the first place, before actually doing that project, I thought it'd be not easy, but not too hard because you have cloud. Everything is 
redundant and protected by different layers of software. So um, usually you don't have to worry about single disk failures or anything like that. So I thought I wouldn't have to stop the calculation or like I wouldn't have to worry about disk failures, anything like that. But there was live migrations and it did affect calculations. And mounting 64 terabytes of storage required some kind of design and uh, trial and errors. And y Cruncher has some two number of parameters. So you can control the disk I.O. size, like block size of disk I.O.s. For hard drives, you don't want to write data by a small chunk, like four kilobytes or something. You, you usually want to write in like blocks of megabytes. But with SSD, I used SSD for the project. SSD is a much better with random access and smaller access. So I had to run some benchmark to determine the best block size for disk access. Thank you. So I remember when I was in school and I had to calculate the exponential. And that was hard because I could only do it for so long because of the memory allocation, that kind of stuff. So doing math in a regular computer is really hard because you don't have enough resources to do so. What the common person should look for if they want to try to do more advanced math like you did? Sure. So there is a web service called Ufram Alpha. That's a free web service. Uh, there is a pro subscription. You, you probably want to pay for it. But with Wolfram Alpha, you only need to enter any algorithm or equation formulas, and Wolfram Alpha will solve that equation for you. So you can render graphs and plot charts, access solve equations on Wolfram Alpha. It's really convenient. I usually use it to start with any like new equations or like mathematical problem. So usually when you use a calculator or computer, you only get approximations. So if you put a third, one divided by three, you never get the true value of one divided by three. But with Wolfram Alpha, it treats the rational number as it is. So you usually get the true value of the formula. So that's really convenient. If you want to play more with math, Y-Cruncher has a feature called custom constant. So you actually enter the formula you want to calculate and Y-Cruncher handles the rest. So you can calculate, for example, um, one divided by square root or something, something like that with Y-Cruncher. And somewhere in between, we have collaboratory, uh, which is a uh, hosted version of Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook is a Python program that you can interactively run Python or any other programs. So there are a couple of services that, where you can use Jupyter Notebook. Uh, Cargo is one of them, Collaboratory is one of them. So you, you just need to log in and you can uh, try different math problems or machine learning problems with that. So it, it's really easy. Yeah, I use it all the time. Before we finish up, Emma, is there anything you want to make sure you get on the podcast or anything cool that you're up to in the near future that you want people to come say hi to you at? So we are planning a talk on this project at Next19 in San Francisco. That's in April. I don't think we have free tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have free tickets, no. I don't think we have free tickets. But if you happen to be at Next19, please uh, come to our talk. We'll invite Alexander E., the actual developer Y Cruncher. Oh, cool. Yeah, and next. So it's going to be exciting. His program was used to calculate, break the world record five times before our record. So it's really a popular program. Mark, I'm probably going to leave you at the booth and go straight to Emma's talk. That seems fair. That's reasonable. I don't, I don't blame you. <laughs> that seems totally fair. Well, Emma, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast and talking to us all about Pi and math and doing really crazy stuff on the cloud. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much for having me. So thank you, Emma, for coming and talking to us. And now we're going to ask Mark the question of the week again. So how do I track what is happening to my containers and who has access to them, changes, etc.? Yeah, that's a really good question. If people aren't aware, on Google Cloud, there is a thing called cloud audit logging. Uh, cloud audit logging is essentially set up to answer that questions of like who did what, where, and when. And that's a thing. And part of cloud audit logging is being able to do audit logging on your containers as well. 
So by default, container analysis audit logging is set up for admin activity. So basically anything in admin that would do to any of your containers. But for example, container analysis writes and things like that and reads are not necessarily set up by default, but you can set those up. So if you go into your cloud console and you go into configuring data access logs, you're able to configure exactly what it is that you want to track with your audit logs regarding to your containers, maybe other audit logs as well. So you can see exactly what's going on inside your system if you want to track certain security things or maybe just see what's actually happening or maybe even debug a problem. So super, super handy thing so that if you ever need to see who does what, where, and when to your containers, you are able to do so. So George Orwell. <laughs> Excellent. Before we finish up, Gabby, what are you up to? What are you doing? I'm doing a lot of stuff. I am going to be on Cloud Max 2019. That's going to be awesome. Nice. I'll be doing PyTexas right after that, on the weekend after I call next. And before all of that, I'm doing a webinar on migrating to Cloud SQL on the Google website. The link is on the blog. Nice. Awesome. Uh, so when this comes out, it'll be Wednesday at Game Developers Conference. So at which point, actually, the Google booth will be open. I will probably be floating through there a lot. I will be presenting at, at the conference on Wednesday. I'll be doing a booth talk, talking about open source and game development. I want to say Thursday afternoon. Check the booth for details. I'll be floating around doing all sorts of Game Developers Conference is huge. I'll also be at Cloud Next, as Gabby will be as well, doing podcasty stuff and giving a talk on Agones and all the other good things. I'll be at East Coast Game Conference in Raleigh, North Carolina shortly thereafter talking about Agones and again, open source. That's awesome. And then finally, I'm also going to be at IO doing some fun stuff as well too. So if you're going to be at IO, make sure to come and say hello. Not even I go to IO. I'm jealous. Yeah. I've been to IO in a while actually. I'm pretty excited. Thank you. Awesome. Well, yeah, Gabby, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast this week. Thank you, Mark. Have a nice week. Yeah, and thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all next week. Bye.